Greetings and welcome back to room 303 in Freshman English. And we turn in your hymnals now to page 704 and following. And we now enjoy poetry collection number six. We're going to look at Edwin Murr's The Horses, uh, uh, Richard Wilbur's The Writer, and Edgar Allan Poe's The Raven. And we're going to ask some questions about why it is that your textbook company elected to put these three poems uh, together. Notice on page 704, we're working with, again, our important big question, how does communication change us? We do have some vocabulary words that we want to pay attention to as well in preparation for both our study as well as our um, assessment of these titles. Let's turn now to Edmund Murr, the great Edmund Murr, Edmund Murr and um, we'll be working now with his text, The Horses. Let's do some biography work on 705 quickly. Notice your dates, 1887 to 1959. We'll read a little bit about his biography, an author of numerous books of poetry as well as several novels. Murr had visions of the future that were rooted in his past. He spent his early years on a farm in the Orkney Islands, south of Scotland. Much of the imagery in his poetry comes from these islands. Let's turn now to the poem itself and we'll read together a close reading. Now, can I say this out loud? Two things. Write this down in your notes. At this point in our study together of poetry, we ought to begin to be able to put together lots of the moving parts and paying attention here specifically to much of the work that we want to, to, to uh, be emphasizing uh, as we go forward, okay? So for example, literary devices, poetic devices, and all the like. Number two, we're going to say about the horses that this is one of the most, or more, challenging poetic texts that we work with as freshmen. Um, we're going we're gonna to maybe have some comment as to why, but we need a point of reference right away. So let's put this in our notes. The point of reference for this poem is timeline, history, historic events. We are working with a time either during or right after the first great war when terrific devastation was happening. And, uh, and, and as we look at the poem, we'll get a sense of what's going on. Okay, let's read together. I'm again with you on page 706. And again, I challenge you, stay up with me and the reading as we work through this text. The Horses. Barely a 12 month after the seven days war that put the world to sleep, late in the evening, the strange horses came. Uh, let's pause for a moment and just point out for your notes. Notice after, uh, uh, barely a 12 month after the Seven Days War. So we, do, we don't know, I mean, like I said, it's rooted kind of in an understanding of the First World War, but let's just call it a terrible war of devastation. All right, so put that in your notes at level one. After, barely a year after the Seven Days War that destroyed everything, strange horses came. By then, to continue line four, by then we had made our covenant with silence. But in the first few days, it was so still, we listened to our breathing and were afraid. On the second day, the radios failed. We turned the knobs, no answer. On the third day, a warship passed us, heading north, dead bodies piled on the deck. On the sixth day, a plane plunged over us into the sea. Thereafter, nothing. The radios, dumb. And still they stand in corners of our kitchens and stand, perhaps, turned on in a million rooms all over the world. Let's pause at line 15. Notice the countdown. Of course, in literature, we know about the seven days. We think immediately of the seven days of creation, for example. Here, we've got a countdown. Little by little, we have less and less happening in the world until finally, no radio signal anymore. Everything has come to a standstill. The world has been plunged into destruction, devastation, right? But now, if they should speak, 
the radios. Line 6, 15, 16. If on a sudden they should speak again, if on the stroke of noon a voice should speak, we would not listen. We would not let it bring that old bad world that swallowed its children quick at one great goal. We would not have it again. Sometimes we think of the nations lying asleep, curled blindly in impenetrable sorrow, and then the thought confounds us with its strangeness. Let's pause for a moment for stanza. Let's make a couple of quick observations at level one. He says it. After the war, after the destruction, after the very cessation of everything that we might call normal life activity, the radios don't even come on. He says something very interesting, the speaker of our poem. He says, if the radios were to come on, and there were to be a voice that came out of the radio, we wouldn't listen to it anymore because it was the voices out of the radio that led to this terrible war in the first place that swallowed up, notice the line again, swallowed its children quick at one great goal. Let's put it at level one. The observation here being made is that usually when wars happen, it is the children. It is the children that will be so quickly destroyed. At 3A already, let's jot it down. At 3A, we can already jot down a couple of classic texts here. All quiet on the Western Front, what many argue is the greatest novel about war and wartime. We also think of the classic novel Catch-22, which in both of these novels, along with Red Badge of Courage, Stephen Crane's classic, we are going to be introduced to the idea of the devastation to the children that usually are going to be the ones swallowed up in one goal. By the way, when we hear the word children here, we needn't think of five-year-olds. We can think of 15-year-olds, we can think of 25-year-olds, because in war, so much is lost, and that's the first part of the poem. <coughs> to continue, line 24 and following now, the tractors, notice the break here, the tractors lie about our fields. At evening, they look like dank sea monsters, couched and waiting. We leave them where they are and let them rust. They'll molder away and be like other loam. We make our oxen drag our rusty plows long laid aside. We have gone back far past our father's land. All right, let's pause there at line 30 and make the next observation. After the war, the technologies that were used during the war that destroyed so much of the world, those technologies now can't be used anymore, right? For those of you maybe who know a, a text like uh, the movie Book of Eli, you know about these kind of post-apocalyptic texts where everything is kind of like it goes back to the way that it was before. And in fact, notice that it says, we've gone back far past our father's land. In other words, this war has taken us back into a darker time. Now, we, we can't even use the very tractors that we used to use. They used to use tractors. Now tractors don't get used. Now they got to use oxen. Now they got to use plows. The picture thus far at level one, then, let's put it in our notes, is things are really, really bad. The war has destroyed everything, right? Destroyed everything. And then, now the conclusion of this uh, poem and the title of the poem on page 707. And then at evening, I'm sorry, and then that evening, late in the summer, the strange horses came. We heard a distant tapping on the road, a deepening drumming. It stopped, went on again, and at the corner changed to hollow thunder. We saw the heads like a wild wave charging and were afraid. We had sold our horses in our father's time to buy new tractors. Now, they were strange to us as fabulous steeds set on an ancient shield or illustrations in a book of knights. We did not dare go near them. Yet they waited, stubborn and shy, as if they had been sent by an old command to find our whereabouts and that long last archaic championship. In the first moment, we had never a thought that they were creatures to be owned and used. Among them were some half a dozen colts, 
dropped in some wilderness of the broken world, yet knew as if they had come from their own Eden. Since then, they have pulled our plows and borne our loads, but that free servitude still can pierce our hearts. Our life is changed. Their coming, our beginning. The shift in the palm happens then, notice, uh, at uh, line 31 for your notes at level 31. And then, we're told, late in the summer, all of a sudden a bunch of horses show up. By the way, did you notice the referencing here to stories about knights? King Arthur and the knights of the round table. In other words, what's being said here is that it's like we were reminded again of the great stories of war and fighting. In other words, the ways in which we were, uh, we were brought back to old stories about the way it used to be. In other words, stories, myths, lead to conflict resolution in the form of war. Then there's devastation. Then all of a sudden the ponies show up and we're reminded again of the old stories, the knights of the, the stories of the great knights who are going off to fight on the great quests, the glorification, we might say, of war. In other words, after the destruction of the world, the horses showed up, and we were immediately reminded of all those myths that they used to tell us, all those stories that they used to give to us about how great and amazing war is when you've got Lancelot and King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table and all of that. Notice at the end of the poem, that the speaker is not sure what to do with the ponies. Like, what do we do with you? Notice you're even kind of freaked out. Notice, in other words, war has created a kind of disjuncture between humans and other natural things like horses. Ultimately, they do use the horses. They have to. They have no technology anymore to allow them to do any farming. But notice the final lines. Um, since then, the horses, line, line 51, since then they pull our plows and born our loads. But that free servitude still can pierce our hearts. Our life is changed. Their coming, our beginning. The world, in other words, has gone backwards. And he says, we're not completely sure how to deal with that. Well, let's jump now to level 2A and talk a little bit about this brilliantly constructed poem. Notice how it begins. It starts out by telling us what has been lost. It ends by telling us what has been found. It begins by telling us how war has destroyed everything. It ends by reminding us that wars begin with stories. The great stories. The stories of the Iliad. The great poem about the war at the walls of Troy. And all the other stories. Of course, by extension, we would maybe say today that if the world were ever plunged into catastrophic war, there would be one or two students who sat in 303, who fought in that war, who would be reminded of the video games they played when they were young. And those video games were often set in war, in wartime, glorifying the killing and the shooting. And yet at the end of a destructive war, they would probably look back with a different understanding. Do you get the picture here? In other words, war, another major message for us at 2A, war changes everything. It destroys childhood, it eats the children, and it tears apart the ability to believe in the old myths. Right? You can't believe in them the same way because you're a bit jaded by the whole thing. Another major message, and finally, at, at 2A, the idea that there's always more hope. The horses show up. Notice the last line again. Our life changed because of the war. There, the horses coming, our beginning. In other words, you learn to rebuild. Metaphorically speaking, of course, there are times in our lives when there is destruction that seems like it's a battle or a war that's destroyed everything. And yet this poem suggests something shows up to kind of help you get through. In this case, the horses. And then you start to rebuild again. It's the nature of our life that we go through challenges, that we have to somehow figure out how we're going to do it. And then we have to start rebuilding. At level 2B, I'm going to challenge you to think about this. What is it that the horses symbolize? Go ahead and write that down in 2B. What do the horses symbolize? Well, many readers of this poem have pointed out they symbolize at least two things. 
backward looking, forward looking. The backward looking, the horses symbolize the very notions of why it is that we believe we can resolve our conflicts through violence and war. The famous stories of the Iliad and the stories of King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table, at least in our Western tradition. These are stories that regularly are kind of trumped out and, and given you know, to students, to children, to young people to celebrate the idea of fighting in war. And again, if you study All Quiet on the Western Front, those German boys who are dying on the Western Front, that is in many ways what they go back to in their classroom. They were taught the ancient Greek stories of the valor of fighting and all of that. Now, of course, they're in the First World War dying in a trench, and they're like, this, this is not like what it was like in the storybooks at all. Of course, you have the same of Henry and Stephen Crane's Red Badge of Courage. When the bullets all start whizzing around, this is nothing like the Iliad and the way he had romanticized fighting. But the horses also represent a second, or symbolize a second thing, don't they? They tell us there's a, there's a future, there's another world, there's a beginning, there's a way to respond to the devastation that has happened during the war. At level 3A, well, we'll ask the question, what is for you the text that specifically speak to issues of war and violence and fighting? What is your favorite video game that speaks to war and violence? And, and answer this question, does it celebrate some ways that killing? Or is it, does it treat it more honestly as being something horrific, something, something terrible? We can think about any number of other texts. We've mentioned already several, of course, the classics. The one I haven't mentioned that's so significant is Virgil's Aeneid. That greatest of Roman epics, which celebrates the killing and the war because, of course, it's a Roman epic. And how do the Romans come to their greatest power? Through tremendous amounts of bloodshed. Finally, at 3b, what is your view about resolution of conflict through war? Are you a pacifist? Do you believe that war is never legitimate? Or are you rather inclined to say there have to be times when terrible people have to be stopped in an ideology, for example, that is going to create all kinds of de devastation and suffering on the planet has to be stopped, and the only way to stop it is through violence, is through war. Where do you come down on that? And of course, think of it this way. In your life, what are, what are examples of the horses showing up? Can you think of a time in your life when things were really, really bad, when everything was kind of hopeless, and all of a sudden, the horses, I'm speaking now, of course, metaphorically, ho the horses showed up. Although I did have a student once who pointed out, in my life, a horse actually was the way I came back from a terrible, terrible thing that happened to me. And my taking care of the horse and raising the horse and tending the horse was in fact a way to save myself and get back on my feet again. So quite literally, in that situation, the horses was a horse. Well, there you go. I hope that study of a poem like this will lead you to more poetry by, uh, by your uh, tremendously gifted poet. Thank you.